Welcome, film fans, to Holiday Victories, where we'll take a look at some Dr. Seuss stories, but not from the books nor cartoons they inspired, but the live-action films starring Carrie and Myers. So I'm Matt Presents, I watch movies the most, and I'm joined, as always, by my wubulous co-host. Hello, I'm a Gwonka and a Bunka Quonk, an Eskimo. And today we're uh, doing the, the classic... A half Christmas matchup. It's only <laughs> only a half Christmas episode. Uh, How the Grinch Stole Christmas versus the Cat in the Hat, uh, the mm. live action movies. Yes, yeah, we're not we're not talking about the animated special where the two just so happen to fight each other. No, we're talking about each movie individually. Yes, this is this is. The Grinch Grinching the Cat in the Hat. Can the Grinch Grinch the Cat in the Hat? Stay tuned to find out. Yeah. All the knowledge here. Uh, I'll, I'll be honest. Uh, in terms of, like, both of the movies that we had to watch, this is probably the most, like, easy to get through Hollow Victories I've ever done. Uh, I For would me. say... I would say... In terms of, like like actually good movies these are probably the two best movies we've shown for this show um that does not make them the most entertaining we've sure, mm-hmm. certainly shown more entertaining things for this show but these are probably the two best movies that we've shown <laughs> for the show debatable but close because i do think that john carter and barb wire carry a little bit of weight like they're for the most part I- fine you know, I mean, just just as a matchup, though. Yeah, for sure, for sure. But yeah, uh, I uh, you know I, I will say, admit a bit of a bias here with this episode. Just going into it, like I prior to this one, this episode, the only movie that we've ever covered on the show that I grew up with was Garfield. And this episode, I grew up with both of these, so I do have a childhood bias with this one. Hmm. Uh, but yeah, no, I, I just kind of liked rewatching these two, but like, I, I, funny enough, I watched both of them last year too, Grinch Run Christmas and Mitzi, our friend Mitzi, uh, picked it as their movie night <laughs> pick one time last year. Yeah. Yeah. No, we have watched the cat in the hat together before this episode, <laughs> before, before we watched the films for this episode. Right. Um. Uh, would you, you, would you like to start us off by talking about The Grinch? Yes, The Grinch, released on November 8th, 2000 by Ron Howard, uh, just basically does a retelling of the original, you know, book slash, you know, the animated special, uh, where it focuses on a green guy named The Grinch who hates Christmas and wishes to steal it. Everybody knows the story. Main difference with the live action movie, with it being expanded, they had to make some changes to, make it more appropriate for a feature length runtime the movie is like an hour and 45 minutes this time instead of you know 22 minute special so they kind of make the town a little bit more cynical make the town learn from their mistakes just as the Grinch has to learn from his mistakes that's the I'd say that's the key difference between these two you got Jim Carrey playing the Grinch doing a honest to god like pretty decent job I'd say most of the time uh I think that there's occasionally it's a little too silly, but I, I would almost blame that more on the direction than the act in itself, because when he did have to act mm. sincere, I think he did a good job. Well, yeah, but I, at the same time, I would say, like, he, he's maybe being a little too Jim Carrey. Mm-hmm. And I'm sure it was, it was like Ron Howard going like, okay, Jim, go off. Yeah, that's why I'm blaming Ron Howard, because I think uh, like Jim Carrey proved that there were points in this movie where he could tone it down a bit. Oh no! Like, but then he immediately went. And as a director, you need to tell, like, "Hey, this is this is not the scene where we're doing this." I think the last ten minutes of this movie could have greatly benefited from that. Actually, hey, this is not the scene where we're doing this. Tone it the fuck down. Yeah, yeah. Um, Jim Carrey is a good, like, dramatic actor for sure. Uh, like, uh, obviously, he's been given credit for that time and time again, right? He did uh, Eternal Sunshine and The Truman Show, right. both, like, great dramatic roles. Even I, I would argue, uh, like, The Mask was sort of, like, why he got dramatic roles later on, because when he has to be, like, Stanley Ipkiss, he's really good. 
like dramatic actor. But yeah. then, you know, he gets to be the mask and he gets to be wild and crazy and cartoony. And and I think I'll- that's almost... That's almost why they, I, I almost feel like that's why they cast him as the Grinch, right? Because the, the original was animated by Chuck Jones. And of right. course you have Jim Carrey, who was the mask, who's this very like Looney Tunes inspired character. Right. I, I was going to just say like on top of the Jim Carrey performances, like uh, w- one that I think like demonstrates him as a comedic actor and a dramatic actor very well is Man on the Moon. Oh yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Because that one, one like goes both movies. ways. <laughs> that one yeah. goes both ways is what I like. Eternal Sunshine, it's mainly serious. There's maybe like one really goofy scene where Jim Carrey is acting like a child, but aside from that, he's playing it very straight. But Man on the Moon, you get a good balance in that one. Mm-hmm. I I guess to get into general thoughts with this one, I think it's like it's a it's a cute little movie. It's charming. Um, yeah. Like like I said, these are like this is probably two of the best movies we've shown for this series. Um, right. I actually, when I told Mitzi we were doing this, Mitzi was like completely unaware that this was a poorly received film, and I, I did have to sort of say like, well, critics didn't like it. I think audiences by and large liked this movie. Yeah, I honest to God, one of my memories of this movie <laughs> comes from a nostalgia critic episode. Uh, where he did the entire thing in rhymes, and the whole ending of his review on that was just, like, acknowledging that no one agrees with him on disliking it. (laughs) Like, that's the joke at the end, is, like, he's the Grinch for not liking the movie, where everyone else is, like, the who's singing. However, I always forget what what they're actually saying. I can, like, kind of sound it out like Gahu Goris or something, but I'm probably saying certain, like, there are probably letters in what I just said that aren't actually in what they're saying. When I was a kid, I thought they were saying Yahoo Doris or Yahoo Forest, something to that effect. I definitely thought the first word was Yahoo. Mm. Um... (laughs) I wonder how many people could get it right off of memory, you know? Um, I, I think, because, uh, well, I think they say more than one thing. They they say it more than one way in that song. I, I think you're right, yeah. Especially, I, I noticed that during, like, the live action one where they were singing at the end. Um, yeah, I like the movie a lot. I understand why it, uh, this and Cat in the Hat, despite me enjoying both of them, I understand why these two movies rub people the wrong way. For people who don't like it, yeah, they're obnoxious. I uh, yeah, I, I mean, think it has an energy that like it kind of works in a way, but it's like yeah. no, I mean like cat like Doctor Seuss's tone is very different from what Mike Myers and Jim Carrey did. Well, yeah, I I feel like Doctor Seuss books they're like picture story books for like like toddlers, right? These are like books written for a very young demographic, and these are both like not only PG films but like real pg films this was Mm -hmm. when we were still allowed to make pg films you know so they're like edgier than than dr seuss usually is a lot more swears the the grinch swears a cuss and it's after he's had his redemption it's (laughs) not even like oh he's the bad guy so he's swearing no he has a change of heart and then he says bitchin yeah then the cat in the hat is just like a straight up pervert it yeah. is a movie. Like, not not just the hat boner. The hat boner is definitely the most infamous example, but there's a lot of scenes where he's just acting like a pervert. Uh, like, there's the dirty hoe scene. <laughs> 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 uh, like, it's just... It's ridiculous. Like, it's, yeah, like, it's kind of a spit in the face to Dr. Seuss's work. I know that his wife didn't care. for. I think the Cat in the Hat movie is why there was no more live-action Dr. Seuss movies, because it probably wasn't just... I don't know how much say she had in it. She may have had, like, owned... She may have owned the character since his past, and so maybe she did have, like, all the say in that, but I have no idea. Uh, But also, the movie did not do well. Like, Cat in the Hat was not well-received. The Grinch, it seems like... Most people, like you said, like critics didn't like it, but uh, general audiences liked it. Cat in the Hat, I, I think it's like rare to hear someone say they like that movie. Uh, here's the weird thing, though. I think if you're our age, if you saw Cat in the Hat when you were a kid, you kind of like it. Right. Because like ev- everyone I know who saw Cat in the Hat when they were a kid is like, no, that movie's like okay. Right. Where if if like people who didn't see it as a kid are just like, this is like the most horrible shit. Yeah, 
I think it's because it, like, I, I don't know, it represents the time pretty well. <laughs> it feels like an early 2000s movie, for sure. Uh, in ways, but... We got I, the I pop mean, song, that's... they even make the joke about it at the end. They have adult jokes yeah. in what's supposed to be a kid's movie. You know... Yes, but l- let's not get ahead of ourselves. Let's talk about the Grinch. That's right, that's right. <laughs> um, I think... Like, they're trying to do some wi- weird, wild stuff with, like, the visuals here. Right. And I think it very rarely lands. It does once or twice. I really like the part where, like, the, the girl's, like, stammering, and, and then the Grinch is making fun of her, and she's like, the, 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 the Grinch! And it's like, okay, that's a good shot, but, uh, like, most of the, like, there's so many Dutch angles. It's like, right. Ron, chill <laughs> out. A Dutch angle does not an interesting shot make. Oh my god, and so looking at the casting right now, I, I, I know we're not on casting right now, <laughs> yet, quite yet, but it's like, I, I watching the movie, because of the fucking Who makeup, I had no fucking idea that the mayor was George Sr. until right now, from Arrested Development, Jeffrey Tambor. Oh, you, you, you didn't know it was Jeffrey Tambor? I, I couldn't <laughs> tell. The, I I think it's like, both the hair and the nose, I just like, compl- I did not know that, honestly. Yeah, but he's got a very distinct voice. I, he does. I can tell it was I, him. I, I can see it now. I can see it now for sure. Um, shit, yeah. Uh, uh, I, so in terms of, like, the retelling, I understand why they expanded it the way they did. I assume that some people who didn't like the Grinch, I, I, if I could get into their head for a second, I would guess that part of it was uh, that... It doesn't do the same message entirely. It do- at the end of the day, it's still the same message, but it's like, in this version, the people in the town are kind of not amazing people, but by the end of the movie, they kind of learn further, like, wrongdoing. So it's kind of, like, mutual in this movie. It's not just the Grinch who needs to learn a lesson. It's everybody that needs to learn a lesson. And I'm going to say, for a lot, for, like, expanding the, you know, short story into an hour, like, almost two-hour-long movie... That's a good way to go about it, I think. I think that's I, a clever way to expand the length of time. Yeah, I, I mean, honestly, that's, like, one of the changes I have actually heard people praise is, like, yeah, like, the Who's are kind of more interesting in this movie because yeah. they they also go through an arc. Right, and it's, like, at the end of the day, the message of the original is that, like, even, the, like, even though he took everything by the end, like, it's, like, the beauty of Christmas. It's, like... Even though everything was taken from them, they still have a good Christmas. They're still happy. And this movie doesn't sabotage that message by doing that. They still, they do the exact same thing. And it actually almost feels more effective because of that. I Like, weirdly enough. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, I'll always praise the original for how much they were, like, how much they were able to do in such a short runtime. Oh, no, I, listen, I, th- I, I I've said this to you already, but, uh, I think... The original Grinch is maybe my favorite Christmas TV special. Right. You know? Because, like, uh... You know, like, the Rankin-Bass specials, they're fun, they're cute, but I don't, like, love them. Same. Uh, Charlie Brown Christmas, pretty good. But I think the Grinch is, like, a masterpiece. I think it's a masterpiece, both in, like, what it was able to tell with the short time, but, like... Also, like, the song is so... Like, it's probably, like, the most notable. Well, they sing... They sing the song again in this movie. Right, right. Because you have to. Like, you have to have that in there. Um, Because it's, like, funny to think about that. Like, the song, you know, had nothing to do with the original book. It's like, but everybody associates that. Because obviously there can't be a fucking song in a book. But uh, everyone associates the Grinch with that song now because of how good it is. Like, it became the most notable thing about him, probably. Uh, Yeah. Another thing that I find interesting about the Rake and Bass special, which, uh, uh wait, not, not Rake and Bass. I, I don't you know. I did, did that again. again. I did it again. I don't know why. I, yeah, it's, it's because of Christmas. No, it's the, uh, Chuck Jones, Chuck Jones special. Um, fuck. <laughs> I, I think it's interesting because it doesn't actually like, if you pay attention to like the book, the style of the book and his special, it's like very different visually. Is the Grinch even green in the book? I think so. But uh, I've seen him portrayed in interest. In, I think in the book he's green, but maybe not on the cover. Yeah, on the cover he is, like, distinctly white. 
Yeah, I think he's green in the... Uh, but, it but looks it's like, a long time. It looks like initially the book was, like, completely in black and white, actually. Okay, maybe that's all it is. Um, and then and then later they colorized it. After, after the uh, Chuck Jones special, they colorized it and made him green. I think that the Chuck Jones special has just some of, like, the best expressions in any piece of animation ever. Like, not just the Grinch. The Grinch has really good fucking expressions, though. But just Max. Max has some hilarious expressions on that. Like, I think that they drew him really well. Uh, <laughs> I, I love the fucking shot where he's, like, thrown onto the... Like, he, you know, he's trying to keep up with the sled, but he, like, goes behind the sled and then gets back on it, and then he just has this big, goofy smile on his face. And then he, like, does the little wave to the Grinch. Like, that's, like... That's a, that's a really good fucking expression. I love it. Um... <laughs> The movie, with it being a live-action dog, they're a lot less cruel to Max, and that was a good call, I think. Yeah. Because if you had a real dog, you know, carrying the sleigh, I don't think people would be laughing at that. I think it'd make people sad. Um, plug to our recent Halloween video. We watched Halloween is Grinch Night. Oh, yeah. Uh, and, like, Max is, like, super sad in that one. <laughs> right. Yeah. But like you, I feel like you couldn't do you couldn't get away with that in the live action movie. It's like no, right. this is a real dog, so like being mean to a real dog just feels wrong. Yeah, Halloween one is kind of unique in terms of like the three animated Grinch specials. Like it's the only one where the Grinch isn't redeemed by the end of it. <laughs> it ends with him losing Max and being alone. <laughs> Yeah. Or even, like, the no, cat it's, that. <laughs> it's weird that, like, The Grinch was a, a redemption story, but every subsequent piece of, like, Dr. Seuss media that uses The Grinch makes him, like, a villain. Right. Because, yeah, he's, Cause, like, the great Dr. Seuss villain. He's, like, who else are you going to yeah. use? Yeah, no, they, in, in Grinch Night, he's a villain. In The Grinch, Grinch's Cat in the Hat, he's a villain. Even in uh, the wubulous world of Dr. Seuss... The uh, uh, Jim Henson puppet show based on Dr. Seuss books. He's like a, an, an evil dude in that show. <laughs> and even if you wanted to argue at the Halloween specials and origin story, y you can't. Like, Max, is, <laughs> Max leaves him at the end, so unless he kidnaps Max again. <laughs> like, he, uh... <laughs> no, the Halloween one just gives him an unhappy ending, and that's it. That's the end of it. Hukariya gets the happy ending. <laughs> So, and yeah, so in terms of the way this movie did its story, I think they paced it out pretty well. Like, I'm completely fine yeah, with how it's ran. I am absolutely okay with the ways they have expanded on this. Because they give, they give like, the Grinch a bit of a backstory. Um, and I, I think it kind of works. Same. I, I think it's goofy, like, in some ways. most Mostly intentionally, but in a couple ways unintentionally. Like, Baby Grinch, I don't... Uh, nah, Baby Grinch is probably is supposed to be really funny, actually. <laughs> I, I mean... I don't know if it's supposed to be... It's kind of like an uncanny image. I think that's why it, like, got memed on, but... Yeah. I, I think, uh... Like, my biggest problem with it is it kind of, like, mixes the Grinch's motivations... Like, in the original, he just, like, hates Christmas, and it's it's not really expounded on why, and I don't, I, I think it's better that you don't expound on why. I think it's it's better if it's just a guy who hates Christmas, who just does not enjoy Christmas. And in, in this one, it's like, oh, he hates Christmas because he had a crush on this girl, and he, he was embarrassed by these bullies on Christmas. To be fair, he did hate Christmas already. Then he was kind of opening up to it because of that girl. And then when it didn't go well, he was like, nope, I was right. Fuck Christmas. Yeah, I mean, fair enough. I, I, I just mean, like, giving motivation to his hatred of Christmas. Right. Uh, I'm not super into it. But I mean, I, as if, you, if you've got to expand the story of the Grinch to an hour and a half, which really you don't have to expand the story of the grinch <laughs> to an hour and a half I, I honestly like we're we're complimenting these films but like neither of them needed to exist i agree i think it's uh. like i think it came at a time though where live action remakes were more interesting than they are now because like 
It was experiment. Well, we were in ex- experimental phase. Like, wouldn't it be interesting to see this in live action? And nowadays, the answer is no. We've done it so many times that it's not even remotely interesting. It'd be a lot more interesting if you went back to 2D. Uh, but at the time, I think it was more interesting. If you did either of these movies today, uh, the main characters would be CG. And probably a lot of, like, the environments would be CG. That's the thing. Both of these movies have some really cool sets. Right. I I, I love the set design on both of these movies, and today they would be CG. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the the entire thing would be the climax of the cat in the hat. the cat in the hat CG is so bad that it's almost charming though. It almost reminds me of just like some yeah, like I mean like they they only use it for like the really weird trip out scene, so it right. kinda works. Right, right. Um, do we want to talk about, so we talked about story, uh, do we want to talk about the performances a bit? I mean, we did a little bit already, but, uh, characters. Yeah, I mean, we, we, we can talk about, like, the cast. Uh, so we talked about Jim Carrey a good bit. I'm gonna say this, like, I like him in this movie. I think he was good for the Grinch because he's able to work with that makeup. That's something that, yeah, I'm not the first one to say it, but Mike Myers really didn't do. Um, uh, he is so... I agree, more or less. And now, to be fair, it could also be, like, Jim Carrey's makeup I, helped him express better, but... Yeah. I I mean, here's the thing. Pe- people talk about, like, oh, the, the cat in the hat is so creepy looking. And I don't think... I don't think the makeup is that bad, but it's also not good at all. I think the and face I, is really bad. Here's the thing. I, I think the Grinch is almost equally uncanny but it it works better because the Grinch is sort of a creepy looking character. Yeah. Like the cat in the hat's supposed to be cute. The Grinch is supposed to look a little weird. So I I think it works for the character better in the Grinch. Now that being said the Grinch makes the horrible mistake of putting all of the other characters in Who makeup. Cindy Lou Who is the only one who is not in some like weird prosthetic nose and it looks terrible. And they make it... I think the Grinch... I think Cat in the Hat made the right call by just having the humans be humans. Yeah, and and we talked about it when we were watching. I think in the Cat in the Hat story they are just humans. Yeah. Like I don't think they're referred to as Who's in the book. Maybe I'm wrong about that. But also, they even make a joke about it in the Grinch movie. Like, they say, oh, she hasn't even grown into her nose yet. <laughs> um, at the same time, it definitely is, like, a standout feature in the Grinch live action. Like, yeah, it's... I would say it's uncanny. I would say it's probably not the right move for the movie. But at the same time, I don't think we'd be talking about... Like, I don't know, but we're, at least we're talking about it. <laughs> At least it did something that made it stand out a little bit. I suppose. I don't know. Sometimes it's fun. To, sometimes it's fun just to see like weird shit like that in a movie, even if it is uncanny. But at the end of the day, it's absolutely something that's not like, oh, because of that, it's redeemed from criticism. No, you can criticize the hell out of that. That looks horrible. I agree, it looks horrible. <laughs> I just think it's like, I kind, I'm kind of glad it looks horrible. I'm kind of glad that it's like just makes the movie. It makes the movie a little bit more interesting to me <laughs> that they all look like that. <laughs> <laughs> all right i wanted to say something about jim carrey's performance i kind of hinted at this already it's not, and this could be partially directed or script even i am mostly okay with the really like over the top comedic performance that he gives at the same time i kind of wish that during the last 10 minutes he would have toned it down because i feel like that is when you're supposed to show the Grinch go for a change. That's when you're supposed to allow things to become a little bit more sentimental. And they throw in a lot of jokes. And here's the thing. If they just threw in a couple of those jokes, I think it'd be fine. But it's like every single beat of the end and he, does, he like cancels it out. The first one is when he starts saying like the actual lines from the book, like maybe Christmas means a little bit more. It's immediately followed by him like pretend like acting like he's having a heart attack, making really obnoxious noises and spazzing out. Then he, like, cries and tell Max that he loves him. So, like, oh, it's this nice scene where, like, he's being nice to Max. But then he says, all right, all right, get off me, get off me. That's enough. Gotta take steps. And it's like, okay, you ruined that moment. Then there is <laughs> him saving uh, Cindy. And then they have to, like, which, honest to God, I think that was uncalled for. Making, like, oh, he's not just saving the I- gifts. He's saving her. 
Honestly, I think that was a good change, because I, I think, like... Like, because especially if you're going to have the Who's, the Who's have to learn their lesson that they don't need gifts to to make Christmas work. It's like, yeah, okay, the Grinch saving their gifts kind of doesn't make a lot of sense then, because it's like, it's kind of contrary to the message. So if he's going to, like, save the girl, too, that makes a little more sense, especially because they, they've they given Cindy Lou Who so much more to do in this movie. Right. She's, like, a big part of the Grinch's arc in this movie. Um, mm. And I, I, I think that's a good change. You can disagree with me, but I, I think it's a good change. I, I hear where you're coming from, for sure. I do think, though, that it is enough for him to just have a change of heart. Like, he realizes they're happy about it. So, I think in the original special, that's all it was. It's like, okay, like, even if I don't give them back, they're fine. I want to give them back now. Uh, You know, I I mean, I I think it works in the original special because, like, the Who's are already sort of, like, you know, nice people. They don't, they already don't need the gifts. So, it's like, well, I'm just doing a nice thing here. And I think it's the same thing in this one. Um... I don't know. I, I I like the simplicity to it, but I hear where you're coming from. I don't think that's a I don't think that's a bad point. Uh, I stand by what I say, but I hear what you're saying. Uh, where were I was going? Where was I going? Oh yeah, and then when I was talking about the fucking emotional beats, then even when he's singing Gahu Goris or whatever it is, he's like he's mispronouncing it like I am, but he's like doing it intentionally. It's just like give him a moment. Just give him a moment where he can play the scene out seriously. I Because here's the thing. Even, like, we'll talk about Cat in the Hat in a minute. I think even Cat in the Hat did a better job with the emotional scene. Because it, like, it let it play out. It let, like, okay, this is the part of the movie where we're toning it down for a bit. And they had jokes after that scene. You don't have to be straight-faced for the rest of the movie. But just, like, cal- calm down for a second, right? Yeah. Because, like, with Grinch, I think the ending of that, like, special, it's a really nice ending. So, like... For this, like, especially after we had to spend so much more time watching it, like, yeah, let the sweet, sentimental moment pay off, you know? I think some people still get that payoff from watching it. Um, I think some people really care, you know, care about this version. It's just for me personally, I would have really liked it if they could have, like, not tried to be funny every five seconds during it. Mm-hmm. No, I, I, I feel ya. Yeah. Jim Carrey is is good as the Grinch, but at times he can be a bit much, and I I think like a better director maybe would have reined him in a little. <laughs> um, I I have some words about Ron Howard, but I'll save them for the <laughs> moment. Okay. But uh, I I I think we can lead into uh, a a discussion about some other Howards because. With this film, <laughs> with these two films, both of them, we have finally dethroned Mr. Rob Schneider as the King of Hollow Victories, solidifying Clint Howard as the absolute king with not three, but four movies, because he is in The Grinch and Cat in the Hat. <laughs> we now have four Clint Howard movies under our belt. I am uh, so happy that Clint Howard is the king of hollow victories. He is perfect for that. He honestly is. He is, like, the perfect face for that. I think of, like, the Who's, Clint Howard is the one who looks the least uncanny. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> because he's he already would. he's already kind of a weird-looking dude. He is a weird-looking dude, which is why I'm happy that he's the king of hollow victories. But also, to because, like, uh, to pay him a bit of a compliment... I also think he normally is, like, part of what works in every single movie for Hall of Victories oh, yeah. he's been in. Oh, yeah. He, like, he, he's I, never, like, he we, always we, fits. We, we said in Rhapsody Street Kids he doesn't really help that movie, but nothing really helps that movie. <laughs> yeah, Mark Hamill um, didn't help that movie, you know, like, professional voice actors yeah. didn't help that movie. Yeah, he, he, uh, we're, we're not, we're not gonna give Clint Howard issues for that one in every other time he's appeared he's like pretty funny even in cat in the hat he has like two lines right but But he works he's just a delivery guy but yeah he works in that moment yeah he's he's uh, like a lot of the howard clan shows up in this uh ron howard's dad rance howard is in it uh, his nephew, Jeremy Howard, and of course, his daughter, Bryce Dallas Howard, who's perhaps the most famous member of the Howard family nowadays. Uh, she, she 
I don't even think she has a line. She's just like one of the background who's, but she's there. She's one of the who's. Bryce yeah. Dallas Howard is in this movie. She's in like the Jurassic World movies, right? Yes. Now, Clint, Clint Howard is not the only returning actor for Hollow Victories. Uh, you've also got Mindy Sterling, yep. who was uh, the the ali- the head alien in Mars Needs Moms. And she, uh, she's the teacher in this, isn't she? Am I wrong about that? Hold on. Uh, I think you're correct. It's hard to tell with the Who makeup, but I think you are correct. Uh, the Grinch. <laughs> I typed in Mindy Sterling, and the first thing to pop up was Mindy Sterling <laughs> the Grinch. Oh, no, no, she's one of uh, the Grinch's gay moms. Okay. That also makes sense. Uh, for the teacher... Oh, Lacey Call, I think, is probably okay, yeah, the teacher. yeah, 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 that's, that's her. That looks like her. Um, also returning, the narrator of this film, Anthony Hopkins, <laughs> who previously appeared in Spice World. <laughs> oh, Anthony, you're, like, so close to avoiding these two. Like, you got a narrator in a cameo role. Like, you could you could so easily not be part of this, but you are. Like, Oscar-winning actor Anthony Hopkins. <laughs> Fucking, uh, 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 Hannibal Lecter Anthony Hopkins. His two appearances. The narrator from The Grinch and a cameo in Spice World. <laughs> Um, <laughs> those, those are the two returning cast members. There are plenty of noteworthy cast members. Three though. returning cast members. Three. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Jim Carrey at first time. Jim Carrey. Uh, he might show up again. I think Jim Carrey's been in enough stuff to where it's possible. It's possible, but I. I don't know what else from his career we would even look at. Mr. Oh, Popper's well, Penguins. Maybe Batman Forever. Yeah. <laughs> Batman Forever has got some potential. Um, Yeah, Jeffrey Tambor from Arrest Development. I mean, I love him on Arrest Development. I've heard, I've heard things about him as a person, but... Uh, yeah, I, I think he's been cancelled, but... Yeah. <laughs> I, well... Maybe more than cancelled even. Maybe, like, uh... Litigation. <laughs> Maybe. Like, I, th- I think there's a difference between, like, you're cancelled for being offensive and you did something illegal. Right. Uh... I, th- I, I think there's a difference between those two things. I would agree, because people get cancelled, like, left and right, and most of the time all that getting cancelled means is that you're under, like, hot water for two days and you're good. Uh, yeah. Uh... Then uh, Bryce Dallas Howard, she has a good chance of, like, the Jurassic World movies, you know. It's not, I'm, not, I'm not saying it will definitely happen, but it's, it's. I think those are up for, I think, like, what, they made one good movie and then. <laughs> <laughs> Even the first Jurassic World movie was, like, pretty mediocre. Uh, but uh, the the one thing I liked about it is that I had this theory that the whole movie was like commentary on how the movie shouldn't exist. Because <laughs> I like they they have like the the Indominus Rex, and it it really seems like the Indominus Rex is supposed to be metaphor for Jurassic World as a movie. Yeah, we we got uh, Molly Shannon is in this movie. Uh, as Cindy Lou Who's mother, Betty Lou Who, um, Molly Shannon decided early in her career that her shtick was being horny, and she has been nailing it ever since. She has some horny moments in this movie. Even, there's a scene where she's watching, uh, the neighbor, Christine Barinsky, who's supposed to be, like, the hot who that, uh, uh, the Grinch was into when he was in... In elementary school, and and who 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 still has a crush on the Grinch? She she ends up with the Grinch at the end of the movie, which is like a weird thing to throw in. Like ah, the Grinch has a love interest in this movie. Yeah, but there's a scene of Molly Shannon watching her like decorate her <laughs> house, and like I like to some degree, it's like it's just the way films are directed. It's like oh, the male gaze or something. Like we gotta show this woman being sexy, but it's supposed to be from the point of view of Molly Shannon's character, <laughs> so it just feels really gay. 
it feels like Molly Shannon is looking at her neighbor and going like, oh, damn, I want a piece of that. <laughs> we got Josh Ryan Evans, who was a very unique unique uh, performance in this movie because he like he is one of those actors uh, who appears to be a child, but he was actually like 17 or 18 when they filmed this. Was he? Uh, Interesting. Yeah. Uh, sadly... Um, did not live long after the after the movie came out. He was born in eighty two and died in two thousand two, so he was only oh. twenty. Yeah, but uh, you know, I think I you know for Kid Grinch, I think he I think he pulled off the role well. I think that it made sense to not put that much makeup on an actual child. Um, as well, but uh, yeah, I think he definitely did the role well. Um. Mm-hmm. Baby Grinch, on the other hand, was just like a fucking <laughs> puppet, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely looks like one. <laughs> There's uh, Taylor Momsen. Oh, yeah, we should like, be talking about her. Who's like a musician now. Yeah. Uh, she She's Cindy Lou Who. Which, yeah, ironically, I, I hope I hope that's going well for her. Um, I, I think that, like, I think she does a good job as Cindy Lou Who. Like, in terms of child actors, like, for a movie like this, it's a little bit, like... Yeah. It's a bit much, but it's like it works for this movie. I don't like the singing. <laughs> I feel mean saying that about a kid, but you know, it's not a kid anymore. But uh I like I really like the like like the harmony of uh Where Are You Christmas, but I kinda prefer it without lyrics, honestly. I like the instrumental score that they like I like it as like a well, recurring recurring piece of the score rather than a song. There, there's also like a version of it over the end credits that is not sung by her, right? Yeah. That's sung by uh, Mariah Carey. Yeah, I still prefer the instrumental. I mean, fair enough. I don't like hate the song. It's just like I feel like the I feel like the sound of the song is like really nice, and then the lyrics, it's like oh, it's just another Christmas song. <laughs> but uh, I think the sound, like the melody of it, it's like super nice actually. Like, it's very memorable. Uh, and I think, like, when you have, like, uh, you know, you're a mean one, Mr. Grinch, and, like, the uh, all the other music that's in, like, the original Grinch special, like, yeah, this was one that, 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 that was a track that was kind of able to, like, help this movie stand out musically from its uh, predecessor. Somewhat ironically, uh, Vern Troyer, who plays Mini-Me in the Austin Powers movies, is in this film. <laughs> So he's he's worked with the Grinch and the Cat in the Hat. Yeah. Did, did Jim Carrey and Mike Myers ever do anything together? Because it seems like they should have. Like at some point, it feels like these two should have crossed paths because they're like fairly similar comedians. They're both Canadian. Um, I mean, I see like, a picture of them together. Uh, I don't. I don't think so. Like, yeah, it's, it seems like they didn't make anything together. That's weird. It feels like that would have happened at some point. Uh, Austin Powers. Mike Myers originally wanted Jim Carrey to star opposite him. That would have been oh. interesting. As, as, like, Dr. Evil? Or, or just as, like, someone? I guess whatever the opposite equivalents of, uh... His character would be. I never saw Austin Powers. Well, Doctor Evil is also played by Mike Myers. Okay, so, my, them, so that's my guess. That's my guess. Like it wasn't originally supposed to be Mike Myers doing both performances, but then it became that. Then I, I mean, I think Mike Myers is a guy who does enough voices that he can he can be in more than one character. Yeah, sure. And we 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 can't neglect to talk about Kelly, who plays Max. Of course, of course. Kelly did a great job. Very, very good dog. The only piece of trivia about Kelly on IMDb is, is a dog. <laughs> uh, was was Kelly ever in any other movie? Was it just... No, unfortunately not. It was, it was just this. And then uh, an award show. And then an award show. Kelly did a good job. Good, good... Good dog. It was a good dog. Yeah. <laughs> um, oh, was there anything else? Like We kind of talked about visuals. We talked about the story. We talked about it being an adaptation. Uh, uh, casting. 
we could talk about Ron Howard a little. Yeah, go for it. Ron Howard is... He's not a bad director by any means, but like... You know how when we were talking about Tom Cruise, we're like, okay, Tom Cruise is like a solid leading man who will not distract from the things that are going on in the movie? Yeah. Uh, I kind of feel that way about Ron Howard as a director. It's like he is a solid director who is not gonna add or take away from what is written for him. I think that's like, there's. There's a reason he's the guy Disney called to finish Solo a Star Wars story, you know? <laughs> right, right. It's like, who's a guy we, the studio heads, can depend on? Ron Howard. Uh, it'd be so funny to see, like, Ron Howard switch places with another director. <laughs> like, see, see, like, because Tarantino's recently in the news for us, like, being another director who badmouthed Marvel movies. Uh... <laughs> So, like, switch Tarantino and Ron Howard, bo- like, switch their bodies to a face-off and see how, uh, <laughs> see, see how Tarantino's Marvel movie goes and see how Ron Howard's Tarantino movie goes. Quentin Tarantino's How the Grinch Stole Christmas. <laughs> Ron Howard's Pulp Fiction. <laughs> Ron Howard's Pulp Fiction is, like, the most boring movie ever made and Quentin Tarantino's <laughs> the how the Grinch stole Christmas is like the worst Dr. Seuss adaptation you could imagine. <laughs> but there are people who like it. Absolutely. Honestly, <laughs> we we were talking about like um after Cat in the Hat, Dr. Seuss's widow didn't want them to do live action movies anymore. Mm. But like I think both of these movies are better than, like, the animated Dr. Seuss movies. At least, I haven't seen Illumination's Grinch. I hated Illumination's The Lorax. It's one of my least favorite movies ever made. I think that The the Lorax is... I think it's gross. I I, I think it's a gross movie. Never saw Horror and Here's a Who. I don't remember Horton Hears Who. (laughs) I remember nothing about that movie. I saw it, and I don't remember it. (laughs) uh so i guess in it it, at least in terms of memorability these two films are definitely better than horton here's a who now if if you want the best dr seuss movie the best dr seuss movie unequivocally is the five thousand fingers of dr t from Mm. like the 50s because it's a movie directly written by dr seuss They came to Dr. Seuss and were like, hey, we want to make, like, a movie based on your books. And Dr. Seuss was like, no, my books wouldn't make good live-action movies. Here, let me write you a new movie. And so he he wrote this completely original movie, and it's great. I really like The 5,000 Fingers of Dr. T. Yeah, I'd love to watch that. We're we're gonna watch the one night, but we just forgot. We watched so much shit that one night. Yeah, uh, it's, it's definitely on my lineup for movie nights. Like, I, it's, it's such an interesting movie. I think more people need to see it. Now, that sounds great to me, honestly. Yeah, like, seeing Dr. Seuss. I love Dr. Seuss as an artist as a thing, like. Yeah. Like, most of his, yeah, most of his books are, you know, like, they're children's books, for sure. But they are children's books that leave an impact on you. It, it converts his visual style to, you know, a live-action medium very well. What what was the one thing called where they called the Midnight Paintings? Yeah. Have you ever heard of like the Midnight Paintings for Dr. Seuss? Maybe? Elaborate. They were a bunch of darker paintings. Not all of them were like like horribly like dark themes, but they were definitely like he wasn't gonna put these in children books, you know? I see. And they were most of them were not released until after his death. Um if you look I up think... Dr. Seuss, The Midnight Pains, there's some, like, really... I love his art style. Like, I mean, I genuinely think it's, like, a really fucking great art style. I I think I've heard of this, like, once. Like, this this sounds vaguely familiar to me. Now I would recommend looking them up. They're just, like... Oh, I'm looking at them now. They, oh, yeah. Some of these are pretty good. Yeah, like, I, uh... I, mean, these... I, I don't know that these are, like... These aren't, like, super dark or horrific or anything. They do just no. look like Dr. Seuss drawings, but... 
At the same time, I don't know that I would put these in a kid's book necessarily. I think they're a little darker, and some of them have, like, darker undertones to them. Like, some of them I don't even know. I have no idea what they what the meaning is, but others, it's like... There's, a spe- there's specifically one with a cat playing pool that has some, like, darker messages to it. Mm-hmm. Um... Because he's on his, like, last life, whatnot. Like, you know, it's going off the whole nine lives. He's uh, a gambler. <laughs> mm-hmm. But, yeah, I, I, I always, uh, I just think, yeah, I just think, yeah, you know, like, who else was able, like, who else looks like him? <laughs> who else has ever drawn shit that looks like his? Yeah. Um, let's talk about Cat in the Hat. Yeah, sounds good. But uh, yeah, overall, Grinch, I like the movie a lot. I think that tonally it could calm itself down a little bit. But all in all, yeah, I still like this movie. I liked it as a kid. I like it now. And it's not like a fucking 10 out of 10 or anything, but <laughs> probably like no. a 5 or 6. But still, like in terms of Hall of Victory movies, yeah. Uh, The Cat in the Hat, a film from 2003 starring Mike Myers as the titular cat in the hat. Uh, follows two kids, Sally and Conrad, whose mother goes out and they're very bored. And the cat shows up to add a little fun to their day, but he causes a bit of a mess. He causes a lot of trouble for them. And ultimately they have to, you know, clean it all up, much like the book. Uh, where this adaptation differs from the book, for one thing... Sally and Conrad have more clear personalities in this one. Sally is a bit of a control freak, where Conrad is like a rule breaker, and you know he's someone who's always getting in trouble. You also have uh, Alec Baldwin in there as their neighbor who's trying to get in good with their mother, uh, who incidentally, during the the events of the film, is trying to keep the house clean because she's throwing a party for her neat freak boss. Um, something the cat, of course, ruins. <laughs> well, my, I mean, we, we've said some stuff about Cat in the Hat, but give me your broad thoughts. Um, I think it's funny. I think that, like, not all the jokes land. In fact, I think a lot of them fall flat on their face. But, I mean, I I don't know. that It's just, like, I think I, the best way I could describe this movie is it just embodies this, like, certain level of confidence in what it's doing. <laughs> uh, where it's, like, this is not a good adaptation of The Cat in the Hat at all. Like, it, in terms of the message, I think, the for the most part, the message is still there. It changes it a little bit, but for the most part, the message of the book and this movie is it's, you know, it's okay to break some rules, it's okay to have fun, but you definitely need to know what went, what the limit is. You need to know, you know, you do need to be a little bit responsible, too. Um, where, but I just think that this movie, like, it, like, took that concept and completely did its own thing with it, and I think you should just make your Mary Poppins comparison. <laughs> Yeah, no, I've, I've said this before, but, like, I feel like if you took this exact same script and you did, like, Mike Myers as, like, a Mary Poppins parody, you know, like, like do to Mary Poppins what Austin Powers was to uh, James Bond, this, like, this movie would not be as hated as it is. I think people hate this movie because it is not Cat in the Hat. But I think it's a funny movie. I think it's got a lot of fun visuals. There's stuff about it that does not work. There are a lot of jokes that do not land. But, like, that's true about The Grinch, too. Same. I think with The Grinch, what it accomplishes better than The Cat in the Hat is that I think both these movies have their own strength and weaknesses. Like, I think that The Grinch, for the most part, the, you know, Jim Carrey, carry version of the character still embodies the character pretty well like it's still it's more obnoxious Grinch but he's still mean he's still gross you know he's he's kind of fitting the quota that he needs well he just needs to tone it down in a couple scenes I think that's all it is but at the same time because he's so over the top he works with the makeup a lot better because that's like a lot of layers of shit on your face you know like he works with it pretty well uh Mike Myers on the other hand Nothing against the performer, because I think he's a good... I think he's a very funny actor. Um, you know, 
you know, I know everybody loves Austin Powers. I haven't seen those, but like, you know, Shrek too. That's also great. Um, but he, uh, the cat just, uh, it's a completely different entity in this movie. It, it's not the same character. I can't like look at Mike Myers, the cat in the hat and say like, yeah, this is, this is the character from the books. This is the character from the animated special. They just personality wise, there's way too many differences between them. In this version, I almost see the cat as like a fucking psychopath where anything that he finds fun will happen and you just have to accept that where at, I, the book it's been a while but the we watched the animated special not only does it seem like conrad and sally are having fun while the cat's there but the fish gets into it by the end like by the end of that special the fish is actually starting to have a good time like that's not that's fun to see that's nice where in this movie they just seem miserable almost the entire time the cat's the only one enjoying the shit <laughs> <laughs> I feel like the kids enjoy it. At first. Uh, at I, first. I, yeah, I feel like it hits a point where they're like, okay, we really need to clean this up. Yeah. But I think that's like more than half of the movie. I think the kids have fun for ten minutes and then they're like stressed the fuck out. <laughs> they 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 do make sure to have the kids like laughing at what the cat says occasionally, even near the climax of the movie, just so like you know, they, they're trying to keep a little bit of that there, but I feel like that's someone that the book, uh, at least, I can't, again, I don't remember the book with the animated special did really well. Uh, yeah, you showed me the animated special, and honestly, it made me appreciate this cat and had a little more, because I feel like I know what they were going for a little better. I feel like they were trying to be more like the animated cat in the hat than they were the book cat in the hat. Uh, which, to be fair, like, I, I, I took the time to reread the book. A little, and, like, the cat, you know, he's fun, he does silly stuff, but he doesn't have much of a personality, and I feel like that animated special gave him, like, more of, like, a goofy trickster personality, and I feel like that's what this movie is going for. Whether or not it succeeds at that, I think, uh, is, is worth talking about. Yeah, but the animated cat didn't have the white fur in his belly, so it's a zero out of one hundred. It's a piece of shit. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, and, and, and Sonic's arms shouldn't be blue, right? Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, dude, I pepper sprayed so many GameStop employees because they were selling copies of the Cat in the Hat game. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I that game looks fucking awful. The movie, the movie game. <laughs> The movie game. I have not played it, but I have seen people play it. I saw the game grumps on it because Dan Harmon, of all people, went on for that episode. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Hmm. Yeah, Interesting. Did you, yeah, no. I might, ha I might have to watch that one. Yeah, it's it's funny. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, they have fucking Dan Harmon on, and now out of all of the games they can pick, they pick the fucking Cat in the Hat movie game. <laughs> <laughs> um... <laughs> <laughs> the the movie the movie I feel like here's the thing I feel like this movie might have more jokes that land than the Grinch but also has way more jokes that don't land than the Grinch I was gonna say that I think that this will oh that was like I was gonna say like because I was talking about strengths and weaknesses versus each other kind of like getting into the real meat of the show you know verse like what does Cat in the Hat do better what does Grinch do better uh, I think the I think the cat in the hat's funnier than the Grinch. I think a lot more of the I, jokes work. I agree, but I also think that the Grinch is more likable than the cat in the hat. Like not just the character, but the movie as a whole. I I mean I I get that. I think like the <laughs> I mean like I just said. I think there are more jokes that work in Cat in the Hat. I also think there are more jokes that land flat on their face. There are more really bad jokes in this movie, and like. <laughs> Aside from my childhood bias of that movie, which, to be fair, the Grinch has as well, so I think it's a fair... I, I, I'm i glad that we're, my childhood biases finally come in, that they're both childhood biased. Yeah. Not just one over the other. But, uh, but I do think that, like, some of the jokes that are really shitty kind of make me laugh because of how shitty they are. <laughs> like, the hat boner is, like, a horrible, horrible joke to put in this movie. And that's why I find it funny. It's just so inappropriate to put that in a Dr. Seuss movie. Like, that is, like, 
You're, I, you're, you're you are making the joke out of the most iconic image of the character, the most e- iconic image of Doctor Seuss, and you turn it into an erection joke. Yeah, like that is <laughs> that is like offensively bad, but it still makes me laugh because because yeah, it's just like it's so bad, it's good almost. I said to you while we were watching, there's, like, the joke where the kid hits the cat in the crotch with a baseball bat and he, like, cuts to, like, him, uh, like, in a dress on a swing. Right. And, like, I've I've seen people criticize that joke, but it makes me laugh every single time I watch this movie. Like, it made me laugh as a kid and it still made me laugh now as an adult. I'm like... (laughs) Because <laughs> it gets hit in the nuts, and then he imagines himself on his. It's like so bizarre, and I think some people just see it as ha ha lol random, which to some extent I get why, but at the same time I think it's just like going to his happy place. <laughs> He's like in extreme pain, so that's his happy place, and because of how like it's, <laughs> it's like really sappy and over over the top, but that makes it funny, you know, because he's. He's not just on a swing with a unicorn in the background. There's flower petals. There's, like, I'm easy like a Sunday morning plane. He's in a dress. Like, it's just, there's so many, (laughs) there's so many decisions that went into making that one shot, you know? (laughs) Yeah, no, it's just such a weird out of nowhere thing that it makes me laugh. (laughs) Right, and, like... That's the thing, I I loved this movie as a kid, and it's entirely because I love this, like, weird screwball humor. Right. <laughs> um, let's talk about the cast a little. Yeah, let me look. Uh, let me type it up real quick. Of course, you have Mike Myers as the cat. Uh, yes. Gotta love him. We talked about him a little. Uh, Dakota Fanning plays Sally. Yeah, she's uh, gone off to be in other things. Yes, I mean she's like a pretty <laughs> popular actress. I just yeah. saw her earlier today because I was writing my Breaking Dawn Part Two video, and I I wrote a joke in the where I I referred to her character as whichever Fanning sibling this is, and I'm like I better double check and make sure this is one of the Fannings, and it was it was Dakota. <laughs> I one of the most uh, memorable actors in this movie for me, despite a smaller performance is Sean Hayes. Yeah. Just because he's really over the top. I like Sean Hayes. I think Sean Hayes is a good actor. I think he's um, funny in this movie. Yeah. I mean, he's he's like the boss and he's the fish. And I think that's kind of funny. Oh, shit. He is the fish, isn't he? Yeah. I only know him as like the, bo- the boss, but now that you say that, yeah, immediately that voice is registering with me. Yeah, that's the same fucking voice. Yes. He's definitely got some movies that could potentially be um, Hall of Victories. Well, yeah, perhaps. The Emoji Movie, Cat and Dogs, uh, The I Three Stooges. Not, I would not make you watch the Emoji Movie. The Three Stooges I, I saw. In, the Three Stooges I saw in theaters, and I actually really liked it at the time. Um, okay. I don't know if I would stand by that on a rewatch but i enjoyed it when i saw it in theaters uh, it could like be paired with like uh oh it could be paired with the little rascals but well, little rascals wasn't hated was it <laughs> i mean i don't think three stooges was hated either it's got 50 percent. that's a negative <laughs> uh 50 percent sounds like they were mixed <laughs> um as far as, like, Sean Hayes, uh, he he's in The Bucket List, which is not a film I am overly fond of, but I thought he was one of the better parts of that film. I think it's a decent movie. Like, we talked about on that yeah. cast. It's not one that I love either, but... Yeah, no, it's it's one I talked about in the op-ed video. Yeah. Um, it was perfectly fine. And I, I think Sean Hayes is, like, one of the best parts of that movie. I think hmm. he's a good actor. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Spencer Breslin as Conrad. Uh, I definitely saw a lot of him at the time and then never again. <laughs> yeah. I, I get him confused with the kid from Spy Kids sometimes. Because <laughs> both of them, like, their careers span the entire, like, 2000s and that's it. 
Right. <laughs> like, they just... Like, 2010 happened, and they just stopped being in movies. He's got a six... A, probably a more six... Like, a... a she ha- he has an actor's sister named Abigail Breslin, who's probably had a bit more of a successful career. Like, she's in the Zombieland movies. Maybe not even more, maybe not even more successful, just more relevant today. You know who definitely has potential to appear on, on this show again? Oh, uh, I know who you're about to mention. Kelly Preston. Uh, that's not who I thought you were going to mention. She's in Twins, she's in Battlefield Earth, and she's in Gaudy. <laughs> oh, so many of these actors I'm looking up have Cat in the Hat as one of the first movies that pops up for them, and that's not a good look. <laughs> Alec Baldwin was in the SpongeBob Square. Hold on, who was Alec Baldwin in SpongeBob SquarePants movie? Was he King Neptune? Oh, he was Dennis. Jeffrey yeah, oh. Tambor. Jeffrey yeah. Tambor was King Neptune. <laughs> SpongeBob movie Hall of Victories when? <laughs> no, it's too good. It's too yeah, no. good. Uh, sponge we'll on do, the run. Yeah, we'll do we'll do sponge on the run. <laughs> uh give uh what's his name? Uh Keanu Reeves his first Hall of Victories appearance. Alec Baldwin also definitely has potential to appear again. You know? Yeah, he he was the one I was thinking about. That's just because he's fucking Alec Baldwin and he's in a bunch of movies. Right. Um I mean, he's funny like, in this. He is. I I think Alec Baldwin is a decent actor. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't always show, but like when he's in good movies, he is good in those movies. Also, weirdly, <laughs> Dan Castellaneta does the voice of the things. He is not the physical performers for the things, but he does the voice for the things. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised uh, if he Mr. shows up sometime. Mr. Homer Simpson. Yeah. Dan, yeah, Dan Castanella is like a, you know, I always have huge respect. He's the voice of the Homer, one of my yes. favorite shows ever made. But uh, at the same time, he's like a lot of really bad stuff. Because, I mean, to be fair, that's kind of like, that's kind of the curse of being a voice actor. You can be the most successful voice actor and you're still going to have a resume of horrible, horrible projects. Absolutely. It's just, um, I don't know. It's part of yeah. It's part of just being a voice actor. It's like the grind. I mean, it's, you're not treated as well as a regular actor, so you have to grind it, a lot more. It, it, even like you, you get onto a cartoon, and then like after like six seasons, the cartoon sucks. Yeah. Because uh, also, also in this film, Darren Norris, he's an announcer for like. Probably something they watch on TV, I think. It just says announcer. That's what he's credited as. Also, Frank Welker is credited as voicing Nevins, the dog, and he also voiced Max in The Grinch. <laughs> well, there's so two may- for him. May- maybe we-, we gotta put him on the list of, like, double-appearing actors. He also, weirdly, he voices Max in How the Grinch Stole Christmas. He also voiced Max in... The Grinch Grinches the Cat in the Hat. Yeah, that's that's a funny comparison. Honest to God, if Clint Howard isn't the King of Hall of Victories by the time the show is over, I want it to be Frank Welkner with all of his performances being dogs. <laughs> well, you know, he's going right above D. Bradley Baker, who also only played animals. Uh, we have uh, Stephen Anthony Lawrence, who was kind of like Spencer Breslin. And a lot of stuff at that time, uh, and not so much anymore. Oh yeah, the 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 kid, the cat in the hat wants to beat with a baseball <laughs> bat. <laughs> Such a good joke. I love that entire oh. scene. Ooh, he probably will show up again because I really want to do a pair up for the Bratz movie. The Bratz movie. We also got to br- do kicking and screaming versus kicking and screaming. <laughs> That's the poorly first movie re- you showed me. Poorly received by Zack. <laughs> so yeah, Zack didn't like it, so it's clearly it's bad. Uh, yeah, that's the first movie Matt ever had me watch. Uh, is it interesting? Because of Duck yeah, Cast. Yeah, because we weren't really yeah, there's like... A, there's a Duck Cast of it. 
Because me and you weren't really tight yet. We were like, we were friendly. We were having conversations, but we didn't talk that yeah. much. Uh, but then for DuckCast, you got to pick a movie. Cheaper by the Dozen he was in. I remember his character in that movie. No, he he, he was like one of those kid actors that like you see his face and you're like, yeah, I saw him in something back in the day. Right. Um, oh, uh, you know, you know who we cannot neglect to mention the cast member we have to talk about, Paris Hilton. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Forgot that. I I, I wasn't gonna mention that. I'm glad you did. Yeah, she makes a quick little cameo. It's a very weird cameo. It's I, another. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's another the cat being horny joke. Yeah, I won't call him a pervert in that scene. That's like the right environment for that behavior. But, uh, <laughs> uh, Paris Hilton as an actress, I cannot endorse because she she has been in some of the worst movies I have ever seen. And to be fair. She is not what makes those movies bad, but she is in those movies, so... I mean, I don't know a lot about Paris Hilton, but isn't she kind of, like, a famous for the wrong reasons kind of person? Uh, she's famous because her dad was super rich. Yeah. And then she kind of made, like, a... I don't know, she she was... She made a spectacle of a spectacle of herself. She was kind of the Kardashians before the Kardashians. She she inspired London Tipton. Yes. <clears throat> Which hey, if you like if you like Zach and Cody, then she did something good for you. I mean, no no complete like hate or disrespect for Paris Hilton. I have no reason to dislike her, but it's just like it's definitely one of those people where it's like. Yeah, I mean, like, I don't expect a good thing from Paris Hilton. She's not interested in the art. She's brought on because she's, like, famous for no reason. As someone who has watched National Lampoon's Pledge This, I have at least one reason to hate Paris Hilton. <laughs> Alright, fair enough. <laughs> Although, she's not even the worst part of that movie. <laughs> Like, she's she's bad, but she is not even close to the worst part of that movie. Any other cast members you want to talk about? I think we got, like, most of them down. Uh, okay, because I want to talk about the director. Go for Bo it. Bo Welsh. Now, Bo Welsh, prior to this, was a production designer uh, who worked really closely with um, Tim Burton, right? He worked on Beetlejuice, he worked on Edward Scissorhands, he worked on the Batman movies. Uh, all all movies with a great visual style, all movies with, like, really good sets. And I think that you see that in this movie. This movie also has really good sets, I think. Uh, this was his first directing gig, and it pretty much killed his career right out the gate. He He... Did not direct anything after this. Now, recently, he has directed a few episodes of the Series of Unfortunate Events TV show for mm. Netflix. Um, which I heard was pretty good. I have not watched it. But I I am at least glad Bo Welsh is getting work. Because, like... Yeah, does he deserve the backlash the, from that? Like, it, he, he's a... He's... The, the problems with this movie have nothing to do with him. Right. Yeah, that's like the shitty thing with the industry. You know, if you Raspberry Awards, go fuck yourself. <laughs> don't don't get me on my soapbox about the Razzies. Get get on your soapbox about the Razzies. I have opinions about the Razzies. You guys, they're like ba like they're fucking basic bitches. You know, when we talk about yes. film criticism. <laughs> Like, yes. okay, like, at least we are actually invested in the movies and we'll give credit where credit's due. These are a bunch of fucking jack-offs hoping for, <laughs> hoping that they can get in with the crowd. Like, ha ha like, point and laugh. They want to point and laugh at someone else so you don't point and laugh at them. I don't hate, I don't hate the Razzies. <laughs> I think it's a very good, like, like, it, it, it 
it's a good way to like introduce people to like the the whole enjoying bad movies scene, you know. But it's it's a show that has gotten it's it's a you know an awards show that has gotten popular to the point that it's like you can't even pretend you guys are doing the worst movie of the year anymore. You're doing the most hated movie. You right. know, the right. Emoji movie was not the worst movie of the year, but it was absolutely the most hated movie of the year. The Emoji so movie was animated perfectly fine. You know, it's like, it's a bad movie because the concept is bad, but like, animation-wise, yeah, what else were they going to do with that? That was fine for what it was. And, and I mean, like, if if they tweaked their branding just a little, if they said, like, most hated movie instead of worst movie it's like okay fair enough these are the most hated movies of the year they are not the worst movies of the year you know the fact that book of henry slid by without so much as a nomination proves they don't know what's going on right absolutely it yeah i have <laughs> i have no i have no respect <laughs> for the rest i I have a little respect, but not that much. It's like, I, oh my... I, I mean, it's... It's kind of like how I feel about the Oscars. It's like... Yeah. I, just do better. Just do better. Now, the Oscars I can get a lot angrier at because the Oscars is a much bigger thing that more people have respect for that I'm like, okay, you guys really need to do better. But the Razzies, it's like, do better. Just do better. Yeah, with the Razzies, I feel like they need, because of what it is, I feel like they need people who appreciate film on there more than anything, you know? Mm -hmm. So you're going to shit on movies. You need to you need to at least know what you're talking about, right? Yeah. If the Oscars are at least being, oh, over-the-top whimsical and happy about it, like, whatever. I'll give the Oscars one thing. I hate them too. That's why I dedicate a you know month of my life every year to shitting on them because I record the video then edit it. Uh, I uh, I will give them this. I think at the end of the day they do some good. They bring uh, bring attention to certain movies that deserve it occasionally. Um, an Oscar can also help a director. Hence Del Toro finally making his Pinocchio movie. You know, I'll give them props for that. But the Razzies, it just kind of feels like it can hurt someone. <laughs> like Cat and that does. No, I'm not going to play this whole high and mighty game. If you like the Razzies, that's fine. But it's just like, I I don't... I, I They got some work to do before I respect them. They, they can make their show a whole lot better. Because I'm not against highlighting poorly made movies. But there's just an approach. There's an approach issue I take with it. Yeah. No. Yeah. That's that's kind of where I come down. Uh, Cat in the Hat directing is not that bad. It, it, no, it like no. it actually in some listen, areas is good. Listen, <laughs> based on what little I have to go off of, there's a little part of me that says Bo Welsh is a better director than Ron Howard. <laughs> I think I put I put both in a similar category aside from the th the only reason I might put Cat in the Hat above that like directing wise is like why there's some like you're right why there's so many Dutch angles in <laughs> Grinch that's the thing, like like Clint Howard is no I'm sorry Ron Howard is trying to do this like weird visual style with the Grinch and like so often it just is like. Oh, I did a wacky Dutch angle, guys! Look, it's a wacky Dutch angle! Where Bo Welsh, I think, actually does a very weird visual style with this movie. You can oh say God. it's off-putting in parts. It's definitely <laughs> off-putting in parts. But it's a weird visual style! <laughs> but it works to the film's advantage sometimes. Because yes. again, like, I, I think that the movie is funny, and I think sometimes I think every time it's funny, aside from like the Pat Boner. I think it's intentionally funny. I love the shot where Alec Baldwin turns around and the cat's there. It is so creepy how they <laughs> shot that, but it works so well. It oh, is hilarious. That, you know what that shot reminded me of? What? Like in the early days of YouTube, there was this trend of like re-editing movies, to, like, like <laughs> editing a movie to make it look like it's a horror trailer for like yeah. a kid's movie. 
And Mary I'm, Poppins I'm positive, is a big one. I'm positive there was one for Cat in the Hat. Yeah, I Mary think Poppins YMS did one. one. I I remember there was one for like The Incredibles where it was like Dash is a ghost was the plot. Like Dash <laughs> dies and he's a ghost now. Oh God. <laughs> um. But yeah, like, it, that is a shot that is perfect for, like, the re-edited horror trailer of Cat in the Hat. And it's, like, so clearly intentional. It's not just, like, uh, <laughs> it's not like, oh, they made a mistake. Like, oh, why, why did they film it like that? No, he wanted it to be like that. That was the intent. Because they have the cat act like a creep throughout the whole movie. He pulls up, like, the, there's the scene where he, like, says, there might be a third option. It involves murder. <laughs> Then there's also like, okay, Nevin's time to die. Like he's freak. He's constantly acting like that throughout this movie. You know, they made the cat a completely unhinged character. Yeah. And I again, like, I get why that is off putting to some people. I get why that makes some people hate this movie as an adaptation. I think the Cat in the Hat is terrible. As a fun movie, I like it. <laughs> and I do think it gets some of the themes down. Still, I do genuinely think that it like. At the end of the day, it took a very different approach. It took a very weird approach. But it got yeah. the message across. Uh, the, the one thing I'll say with the message is I think they made it a little weaker by giving the kids, like, these, these personality traits they need to overcome. And, it, I mean, Fair. it kind of works. It kind of works with Dakota Fanning. But, like... Conrad was already a rule breaker, you know? Oh. He didn't need to learn that it's okay to break the rules sometimes. I I don't I don't think he had that good of an arc in this movie. I think the idea I think is, if, like, both need to balance each other out. Conrad needs to be a bit more responsible. Sally needs to be a bit but more... I, I don't think they did. He needs to be a bit more responsible very well. I feel like I if they were... If they were both, like, stuck up the way Dakota Fanny's character is, I think it would work a lot better, right? Yeah, I, I'll give you that. Because I think for Dakota Fanny, even, like, in terms of, like, development throughout the movie, the birthday party scene was a really good scene to kind of, like, kind of, like, put yeah. her character into perspective, where Conrad didn't have that. Yeah. No, I, I feel like Conrad has, like, almost no arc in this movie. It's It's, like, a weird heel turn right at the end. Yeah. Yeah, like, there's this big emotional moment between him and his sister, and it's like, yeah, did he earn that? Yeah. Alright, anything else about Cat in the Hat? Uh, not really. Okay. Um, we've been going longer with these episodes, but you know what, <laughs> I'm okay with that. Let's yeah, make this a longer show. We've had more to say, I'm sure eventually we'll hit one more, it's like an hour long, because we're like, what the fuck are we supposed to say about this? <laughs> Oh, it will not be next episode, but... <laughs> oh, boy. Get me um, excited. Are you, are you ready to move on to voting? I am, and it's very hard this time. I agree. I... that I mean, that's the weird thing, is, like... Peop, like, people kind of like the Grinch. There's some appreciation for the Grinch. There's very little appreciation for Cat in the Hat. But I'm, like... No, these these are pretty equal in my eyes. I would say these are like not that much different quality wise. Yeah. Um, you've got the first vote though. I I'm going with the Grinch, but it is close. I think the Grinch the I think Jim Carrey does better as the Grinch. I think it matches the character better. I think it still does the message pretty well. I like the way they expanded on the story. I like some of the music. I like, you know, sets in both the movies are great, but I almost feel like the Grinch is set is more grand, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and while I do think The Cat in the Hat is a funnier movie, I think if I had to compare and contrast every single detail, even though I think in some cases they're close, like I think both movies have good sets, I think The Grinch wins every single point except for comedy, but it's a lot closer than normal for Hall of Victories. Like, it's a lot like The Grinch is just over the line. I think I would give Cat in the Hat visuals over The Grinch as well. Um, I 
I gotta be honest with you, man. I think I'm going cat in the hat on this one. I'd say go and for it. I... Here's the thing. You, you were talking about, like, a childhood bias. I also very much have a childhood bias here, and I think that's kind of where my final decision comes down. Because honestly... I think these two are equally good. Like, I don't think one is necessarily better than the other. But I'm thinking, like, these are movies meant for kids. And yes. when I was a kid, I loved Cat in the Hat. I thought Cat in the Hat was hilarious. I was fine with The Grinch. I didn't think it was the greatest movie or anything. I'm like, okay, well, the cartoon's better, but uh, this is fine. Yeah. I loved Cat in the Hat. So, for me, as a kid... The, these movies are directed at me. I prefer Cat in the Hat. <laughs> I think that's fair. I, I, you know, and honest to God, there's I, I, I'm trying to think of how I'd think about it as a kid. There's a chance that kid me would agree with you. Um, I did like the Grinch I mean, one as a kid though too. It, it it might be down to what you said. Is like the Cat in the Hat is funnier. <laughs> yeah. Right. And yeah. like like me as a child would prefer the funnier movie. Yeah. No, um, yeah, that's fair. Now I'm positively in the minority with this one. This vote is the biggest margin we have ever had. It is 91% for the Grinch to 9% Cat in the Hat. And I even, I sent you the screenshot a few days ago. It was 100% for the Grinch. With like 18 <laughs> votes, it was 100% for the Grinch. We are at 33 votes, and it's 91% for the Grinch. So I'm pretty sure that's like one vote for Cat in the Hat, maybe two, maybe two votes for Cat in the Hat. So shout out to the two people who are with me, but uh, <laughs> no, the audience definitely is is leading the Grinch here. Yeah, com comment if you're one of those people and you'll be Matt's new favorite subscriber. <laughs> <laughs> um. I, I, I understand why the Grinch has won this vote. I think public perception of the Grinch is much higher than public perception of Cat in the Hat. You know, on one hand, I almost wish I would have voted for the cat in the hat, so we just could have had a moment of solidarity there, you know? On the other hand, you know, hey, the Christmas movie won the Christmas episode. That's nice. Yeah, that is nice. And you know what? I, I'm okay with you voting for the Grinch, because I'm like, I get it. I get it. I, I, I will be the sole defender of cat in the hat. <laughs> I'm fine with that. <laughs> Now you got you got two you got two partners in crime. How the Grinch stole Christmas wins. Yay! All right. Uh, so next episode, it's gonna be the first episode of the new year, and I I think we gotta start this one right. <laughs> okay. Because so often on this show we're looking at like corporate products with like not a lot of enthusiasm put into them. So next time I say, let's let's talk about what happens when the opposite happens. When someone is too ambitious with their project. When, when not one, but two directors make post-apocalyptic films. And granted, very different post-apocalyptic films. But post-apocalyptic films, nonetheless, that are way too much. That go way over budget. That are far too ambitious for what they're trying to do. Next time, we're going to talk about Waterworld versus Southland Tales. <laughs> I am vaguely familiar with these two. I don't know a lot about them. I feel like Southland Tales I've heard a lot about, though. Uh, it's from the director of Donnie Darko. It's like... Is Southland Tales the one that's getting potentially getting the really long re-edit? Yes. Yes, uh, Richard Kelly's Southland Tales, uh, versus, uh, 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 Kevin Costner's Waterworld. Uh, Ke Richard Kelly has threatened to release, like, an eight-hour cut of Southland Tales. <laughs> Let's do that one for all of it. Everyone watch the eight-hour cut, sorry. Nothing I can do. You have to watch it. It's already really- both of these movies are already really fucking long. Oh no. How long is Southland Tales? Southland Tales is... 
Well, uh, it says 145 minutes on on Letterbox. Let me pull That's... the movie off my shelf and see. We've had what... those before. That's like t- over two hours at least. It's in like oh, Star Wars. Wait, and... hold on. I have the I I do have the slightly longer director's cut. It's uh 13 minutes longer. I mean, that seems like an unfair disadvantage to Southland Tales. They'll bring it down like significantly if you okay. add time Although, to it. Well, let me <laughs> let me pull Waterworld because I might also have the director's cut of Waterworld too. Yeah, no, I I have I have the director's cut of Waterworld as well. You want to watch the extended <laughs> cut of both of these movies? I, I wish you would have shut the fuck up. I could have. I kept going. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and the director's cut of Waterworld is way longer. It's like <laughs> forty minutes longer than the regular cut. Oh, God. Up to you. We can watch the theatrical cut, or we can watch the director's cut of both we, of these. We gotta do the director's cut now because it's just. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Next time, the director's cut of Waterworld versus the director's cut of Southland Tales. <laughs> Fuck it, we're gonna start 2023 right. <laughs> oh, Chris oh. and Mitzi are gonna like dr- either drop out or <laughs> not join us. <laughs> oh, I am looking for. You have no idea how much I am looking forward to this one because I love both of these movies. <laughs> okay, I mean, are they, so they're at least gonna be fun, bad. They're going to be fun bad for me. I don't know how you're going to respond. Okay. Well, I'll go into this. Uh, for, for, God, we're going to be doing this during holiday season where I'm working six <laughs> days a week, too. Like, <laughs> this is just like, this is just like the nightmare scenario for me. But let's do it. I'm, I'm ready. Hell yeah. <laughs> yeah. So now, now that we've got everyone hyped up for that... <laughs> Uh, any final comments? Uh, Merry Christmas. And a happy Hanukkah. Merry Christmas, happy Hanukkah, happy Kwanzaa, happy Solstice, happy Lemmy's birthday, uh, whatever it is you celebrate. From us here at Hollow Victories, happy holidays, uh, and we'll see you in the next one. Peace be with you. Peace on Earth. Goodwill peace towards on- men. Wait, did I say the wrong thing again? Yeah, you, you said peace be with you, which worked <laughs> last time because it was a Christian movie. God damn it. I fucked it up. I fucked it up last year and I fucked it up this year. <laughs> <laughs>